na tutange sojete na Cuba oh tu za poto ilipo na tutange sojete na Cuba oh tu za poto ilipo huyu ni nando wa pinala obo manando na ditope konja oh ze made tu ilike yeah edu angulu la hobi I was not born in Windhoek. I was born in rural Vangoland and um, became aware of what was going on in the country through my father, who was a laborer at the age of about 16, 17. He had to work from Vangoland to work on, work on, on farms, which belonged to English people. Dutch, perhaps sometimes, and German. To him, all these people were together. Well, I mean, were the same thing, really. They were white farmers, which means they were re they were they were people who who owned the land, and he had to work on the their land. He didn't really think much that this was his land because he's from Obamboland, but it was actually land that was taken from people like his forefathers and so on. So, but my father said, no, but there are differences between. Apparently, there are differences between Germans and the English, because everybody wanted, had their own versions of taking over the world, so they were not really exactly the same. Uh, my father even made a song, um, the, the, the marvel, the, 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 the irony of the English fighting the German, because they were more or less the same. Not only because we were white, but it's like they were, wanted to be first to oppress the, you know. During the First World War, it was German who was colonizing Namibia. You may how the World War ended. The German was defeated and its colonies were divided into the powers that defeated German. And then Namibia was given to, to to Britain, to Britain, to take care of it, to give those people education until they come to the level whereby they can determine for themselves. So the idea was that um, former German and Turkish colonies would then be handed over to the League and the League would then allocate uh, these territories to um, members of the Allied forces, uh, the Allied governments. So initially it was supposed to be Britain, but uh, South Africa took the responsibility of administering uh, Namibia. Namibia was then uh, supposed to be um, uh, um, a Group C mandate, which effectively meant that they were not supposed to be able to, to govern themselves in the foreseeable future. And thus South Africa had to assist them um, developing them to be able to reach that state. From the German to the South African, there were a lot of atrocities, sufferings of the black people being just killed like flowers or like animals. South Africa brought it is a policies of segregation, discrimination, that is called apartheid. My country, I have become a stranger in the country of my birth. Now I find myself a stranger in a strange country. The basis of the apartheid policy was basically one in which uh, 
every ethnic group on account of its distinctive uh, econ uh, history, language, religious orientation, etc. Uh, should be seen as a distinct unit. And this, it was believed, should also apply to the African people of Namibia. If you look at apartheid as a form of government policy, originally it was envisaged as one, or rather as it developed later on, as one that would give the African majority a real stake in the country, self-government and things like that. But the way it turned out to be effectively meant emasculating them and turning them into um, more or less uh, puppets of the central government. In terms of Swapo's origin, uh, it's very interesting. It's, it's very different from the ANC, for example, in South Africa, which some people don't, don't recognize. Swapo's origin lay in the labor movement. It, it emerged out of the migrant labor system that was established here during the colonial days, after the genocide of the Germans, after the land theft and grab uh, by the white settlers in this country and the discovery of, of diamonds, fishing industry, etc. All that culminated in a scenario where um, the employers, multinational corporations, but also private white farmers, needed labor. After this, the Second World War, a huge amount of farms were newly created in, in uh, Central and South Namibia. The boundary of settlement was pushed into the desert or semi-desert area like uh, towards the Nami but also towards the Kalahari and the idea was to have a, a cluster throughout the whole police zone with European farms. So I think the amount of farms um, almost tripled from after the Second World War from 1945 up to 62 or so. And because they had exterminated in the genocide large parts of Namibians in the central and southern parts of the country, they instituted a migrant labor system bringing young workers in from the north um, under extremely strict regulation, dehumanizing conditions. But in these hostels, that they called ironically single-sex hostels, where these migrant workers were accommodated, they met workers from other areas as well. And it set in motion kind of discussions about their conditions. So at a certain stage we decided that how long can we go with this problem? And these spontaneous anti-colonial activities were put together and we form up what we call Ovambul and the People's Congress. This Ovambul and the People's Organization is just based on the labor problem. But the problem is not the labor. It's colonialism. So we decided to form the Southwest Africa People's Organization to embrace all of the Namibians. What became Swapo later started in Cape Town. And it started as Opo, which whose main point of complaint was the labor, was the migrant labor system in Namibia. Not apartheid, not, or at least not explicitly against apartheid and not ex explicitly for independent Namibia. So it wasn't really the, the kind of winds of change that uh, Macmillan spoke about, you know, it was not like, it was not Nkrumah really. We mobilized the people, the country workers and the industrial workers as well as um, uh, domestic workers. And the response was overwhelming. If it's this slavery, this type of 
treatment was brought about by the barrel of the gun. And then now we find ourselves as also being killed by the barrel of the gun when we formed a swapo. Then I said, we also decided that we are many like them. We are not the cowards in this Namibia. Uh, although we followed the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, said, uh, this peaceful means of achieving our independence is not going to work. Let's take our programs and speak to the colonizers in the language they understand. And that's what we did. Twenty seven of us were charged um, under because they didn't know what under which law could they charge us. Eventually, a new law was promulgated in by the South African Parliament, that one of terrorism, nineteen sixty seven, and. Uh, after the new law was promulgated, we were charged under that law called Terrorism Act. My father was a political activist and uh, he was constantly tortured and jailed. And uh, it, it, it was a very uncomfortable situation because you just, you, you were never, you couldn't just rest. You, something was always happening somewhere, somewhere, to your family or elsewhere. So uh, what happened, and then sometimes schools were closed, you know, because uh, the, the schools were attacked. Or, so there were so many, uh, people just went through a lot of difficulties. So in my family's case, like a lot of other Namibians, my father thought enough was enough. And that was in 1975, uh, 74. He was jailed just before uh, that, and uh, alongside with other Namibians. And they decided, you know what, let's go. Let's go into exile. And when I joined SWAPO, I... And luckily, I went to the Soviet Union. I had some time to listen more, a little bit more about what really was going on and the version, at least, this was the version of the Soviets, what's happening in the world and why it was the way it was and what was it all about, what was America also, because I never really had the time of, when I thought about America, it was the United Nations, actually when I was growing up. America was, there was not, to me, there wasn't really Washington, there was more New York. And uh, the Americans to me also were actually black Americans because even though I knew about Washington and, and Jefferson and uh, those other first guys, I, to me, America became the symbol of the black man who was not the black man as we know him in Africa. I went to accompany one of my colleagues from Mozambique. Uh, there was somebody who came from America, from State Department, to interview some refugees, to give some scholarships and so on. Then I just accompanied the guy, and I was sitting somewhere, and they were talking, talking. When they finished, he asked, uh, are you also from Mozambique? I said, no, I'm from Southwest Africa. So oh, we had Mr. Chibanga here, or Swapo. Why well, didn't you mention? What's your name? I said, Ken Gov. No, he didn't mention your name. What's your background? I said, well, I was a teacher, so-called teacher at home. But uh, I'm supposed to go to Ghana to go and study there. Then he asked my background. He said, but you are more qualified than the ones he was giving us, you know. So we came and saw him. And then he took our names, 
uh, in one week's time, we got a letter signed by Dean Rusk. And I used to always boast that my scholarship was approved by Secretary of State Dean Rask himself. And thereafter, I ended up in New York because then I was also appointed a swap, swap representative. And I had to be close to the United Nations. So that's how I came to Fordham University. And then, as I said, all campuses started to get uh, African studies. And within that African studies, my professor turned out to be Tilton Lamel. Lamel, you will check, he was a political science teacher. But I give credit to him. I was an African from African continent. He was an African American. But I didn't know Africa. He taught me Africa. Then after the late, I went to Cuba to study. And I spent six years in Cuba. So it's where I believe that I have tested my leadership. Because I had to lead these children on behalf of their parents. On behalf of their parents. And all, all over Namibia, wherever I go. Companero Kanana, come star. All over Namibia now, they call me uh, Abrello. You know what? Yeah. Does anyone of you know Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> Abrello. Yeah. Abrello, come esta. Don't stop. I said, Timbo, no, no, vemos. <laughs> so now, I am a father of many, many Namibian children. Not children. I'm sorry to say children. They were children when we were there. Now they are big people, they are generals, they are ministers, they are doctors, they are engineers, they are lawyers, they are whatever. And wherever I go, I'm, I'm the first to be given a chair. The Zambian uh, government, under the leadership of Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, uh, the government was very gracious uh, enough to give us this piece of land in the western province of Zambia. Uh, and of course, it was just a land. It was untamed, you know. So we went there and uh, we, we tried to make it our home, you know, by starting sleeping under the trees. And then uh, we had tents. And then after that, we started making our own houses. And that is where I grew up. Let me tell you, a lot of people who were SWAPO members, and some not, uh, even those who were not SWAPO members, but were really dying for the liberation. They really wanted to see the country free from the apartheid system. Ah, oh, they, they just, they, they just loved the SWAPO leadership and what they were doing. They had a lot of respect for people who were sacrificing their lives in exile. And a lot of them up to today, they might have not met uh, people like uh, uh, Sam Nuyoma back then, but you know, they held these people dearly to their hearts that these guys, they are sacrificing their lives out there just to get us freedom. I have been living in Tanzania for 10 years, 8 years in Zambia, 10 years in Angola. Pre-independence days, you know, in the, in the 80s, Nyoma kind of assumed mythical proportions in the uh, political culture here, mostly because um, he wasn't there. <laughs> and he was the man who kind of held back the process that the South Africans tried to implement in 79 um, and was seen as the father of the struggle, incorrectly so. He was a good looking guy, very distinct face, you know, and became the face of the, of the armed struggle basically. Um, 
which Swapa also pushed that image. They pushed it very hard. You can see it in all the imagery of their posters, um, the cult that basically was created around the Yoma. But the people who really had set up Swapa, um, and Dima Toiva, Ya Toiva, you know, all those people in Robben Island, they were locked away at Robben Island, were inaccessible. So, but they successfully invented this country through ideas. One of the successful inventions was the Namibian flag, the Namibian colors. The colors, this uh, blue, red, green, which later became the, the colors of the new national flag, were used as political expressions, so in, during the, the, the struggle in the 70s and 80s, if you want to express your political idea, you would have a, a t-shirt with these three colors, or you would dress in these three colors, and so on. So it played a big role. All I knew growing up is that courage. It's a comradeship. Everyone was a comrade. I mean, okay, within the Swapo party, but even when you came back because that thing of comradeship was embedded in you, you, you breathe it, you live it, you know, everyone is your brother and sister. I personally, even people who didn't belong to Swapo, they were my country people. Posters were just made willy-nilly in a sort of whatever way we could do it. A lot of those were just sort of really, it was a mixture of the cartoons, a mixture of photographs. Whatever sentiment was going, and I mean, once again, I hadn't had much experience or training in, in design or anything. And it was just something you knew what would get to the people. And we had to mobilize the people, it was as simple as that. So we had a, a press, a, a wonderful Italian press for t-shirts um, stored in my, my garage, which People would never ever you know, have considered looking there at the time. They were searching for this thing, knowing of its existence. And we, of course, right through, burn the midnight oil, we'd go right through the night, and we'd print posters, we'd print t-shirts and things like that. The quality wasn't very good, but the message was there. And of course, for the people to see a t-shirt like that, when, when virtually everything that was Swamper was banned, uh, for people to see that, it really lifted a lot of people's spirits. So that was fantastic for us. You know? Um, of course you felt, you know, you knew you were doing wrong and you knew you could get punished for what you were doing, but, well, that was it. The, the struggle, the battle lines had been drawn and that was it. A perception was created that there was only one political movement in all of Namibia and that was Swapa. That historically is incorrect. The first true Swap, uh, Southwest African and Namibian liberation movement that was formed was the old SWANU, S-W-A-N-U. Um, they also had a bit of an army at the side, but they were more inclined to mm, political programs than you know, in an armed conflict or you know, armed liberation struggle. And because of the AOU's insistence to Swapo in the early 60s that they would support Swapo as the, own, the, the only uh, legitimate representative of the Namibian people was tied to them taking up an armed struggle. There were lots of ideological issues streaming around this, had to do to a large extent with the Brezhnev doctrine that was basically an expansionist plan into an Africa uh, which was supported financially and militarily, but arms was a way of getting the liberation armies on their side and following their doctrine. Yeah? Um, until, and, and up to that point, um, it was sort of fairly open, but from that decision onwards in the 1960s by the OAU, there was a very distinct hardening of positions, you know, vis-a-vis -vis independence for Namibia both by the 
apartheid era uh, authorities, South African authorities, and by the Swampo people, because yeah, I mean this was now a cold war was getting into a hot war. The the liberation struggle took place at the height of the cold war. Um, in our case, 1960s to into the 80s, and it was very, very clear from, from early on where the Western powers lay. They, they, they clearly, particularly after the independence of Mozambique and Angola, mid-70s, they then uh, proclaimed to become socialist states. That is where the Western powers like really uh, drew the line, they drew the Iron Curtain and said, we don't care what people want. We don't care a damn what Namibians want. We decide it mustn't become communist, no matter what. Now, the Western powers found the apartheid regime at the time not particularly convenient, but because they were firmly anti-communist, it was the way to go. Actually, in the Soviet Union, uh, the leaders in my Swapo group said, no, 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 don't get involved with these people. Don't listen even to what they were saying. Uh, so Swapo were writing in their writings that we, uh, the Soviets, the Russians are our friends and so on. But the Swapo leaders actually said, no, be careful, don't touch these people. So that's what they told me. I thought, no, but you know, these guys are really Moscow. But no, they were not. They were not, they, don't, hear, don't believe this thing of Swapo before, they, it's not what, no, they were not, they were, not, they were never like that. In my experience, the Swapo leaders were not really, they were not socialist, they were not communist, they were not even communist influenced, not really. There were more Gruma, Naza, there were perhaps the African aristocracy. The early demands inside the country were very pragmatic. There was nothing like scientific Marxism, uh, Leninism in, in Swapo's own thinking. It was an end to this occupation, an end to the racism. That was a key one. So Swapo, in that sense, ideologically, was more of a nationalist movement than a socialist movement. There were those in the United States, I'm getting back to your original question, who thought that we should have no dealings with SWAPO, no dealings with the ANC. We saw them as political movements that had a military wing. They were heavily dependent on their supporters in the East Bloc and the Soviet Bloc. Um, and as a result, it showed sometimes. I mean, that's, that's the reality of the world. Um, but we never made the mistake, and I want to underscore that, of, of saying that because SWAPO had a Soviet relationship or a Cuban relationship or an MPLA relationship that we wouldn't talk to it or that we didn't want to see it participate. No, of course, it had to, something to do with, with the general atmosphere in the world and, and the role of the Soviet Union, Union as well as a support of, of Swapo. Uh, and it, it was not an easy move for governments like mine to start assisting Swapo. It was a liberation movement, it, it engaged in armed struggle, but we got a decision in the 60s that we should start assisting SWAPO through humanitarian assistance and very strictly in that. Because I think there was general sympathy, I mentioned this uh, missionary connection in, in Finnish case. Now, when you speak to people who fought SWAPO, and you, you speak to them about the contents of Swapo rucksacks, what a lot of them mention is not Soviet gear, of which there was certainly no shortage in that combat zone, but gear from the Nordic countries, gear from uh, conscientious co-travelers, or I suppose a better way of putting that would be uh, gear from co-travelers of conscience who would provide medical aid, who would provide uniforms, who would provide shoes. That's not Soviet bloc aid. That's aid that is being extended in a kind of transnational civil society sense to an organization that's done an excellent job 
of positioning itself on the correct side of the moral dimension of the war in Namibia. In Angola, there were, there were two strong uh, political or liberation movements that's uh, MPLA, MPLA, and the UNITA. MPLA and UNITA started to, to fight each other there in Luanda and then in, what happened in UNITA went to South Africa to get the support from South Africa to come and fight MPLA so that the UNITA can take over. Um, and UNITA is receiving not only direct funds from South Africa, direct provision of material aid, uh, but also funds to purchase uh, on the black market. South Africa is serving as a, as a nexus for um, UNITA's ivory hunting. Uh, and then on top of that, South Africa is funneling seized ANC weapons caches, both to Renamo and UNITA. So UNITA is not short of bullets at this point. I, I recall one of the UNITA deserters I talked to in, in, in Angola talked about it in a very interesting way. Uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, our unit or our, you know, whatever detachment uh, uh, section had, had the right uh, to one C-30 load dropped every quarter <laughs> of ammunition. So this is a guerrilla operation and they were guerrillas, but a guerrilla operation that can count on having a C-130 <laughs> uh, of supplies every quarter, you know, and good communication so they could predict on that is not quite your classic uh, live off the land guerrilla. South Africa thought that there was just a band of uh, uncivilized, not well organized guerrillas that they can overrun within several hours. But it took them now over 18 years, and they have realized that they cannot win that war. The Clark Amendment is a good example of doing very little uh, to have an enormous, a disproportionate perhaps, military effect. Yes, I supported repeal of Clark. It didn't come until 1985. When it did come, we had a big internal discussion inside the administration as to what to do with the new authority that we had. Should we, in fact, um, go back into supporting UNITA with uh, covert assistance? Um, or should we just leave the tool on the table and refer to it so people would know we had the option, you know? <laughs> In the end, we decided to go forward with a, I would underscore this, a very modest but important program of military um, assistance and some associated training. And since the Soviets were providing between one and two billion dollars a year in what effect, in effect was uh, military loans to the MPLA regime. Um, this was a very asymmetrical situation. Uh, during the phase that we're talking about here, the only group that is receiving more covert aid from the US is the Mujahideen. So it's a trickle next to what the Soviets are producing, but it's not a trickle for the US. It's a large amount of money for the US and it is being deployed in precisely the area that UNITA needs it, which is specialized military technology and rhetorical support. And I supported repeal not because I, I necessarily believe that we should go back into the covert assistance business, that's a separate question, but because it would send a signal. It would send a signal to the MPLA, America is back. It would send a signal to the Cubans that America is back and to the Soviets. And you know the international law that if you call in your country foreign troops, the other party will also call the foreign troops. The Cuban came there because UNITA brought in South African troops. Then 
a, 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 a impeller brought in the Cuban troops then. And we were there also fighting for independence of Namibia. So as a result, UNITA became our number one enemy together with South African troops. Then the war started there. One of the TRC reports makes this interesting point in its introduction that the vast majority of South Africa's human rights abuse victims were in other countries. And here we're talking about SWAPO cadres. We're talking about people in the tribal areas of northern Namibia. These are the folks that bought South Africa's freedom. And I think they did it in the battlefields of southern Angola. In general, I learned from Namibia exercise that you have to have the support of the United States because otherwise you can't actually get anything done. Uh, so <clears throat> when the Reagan administration entered office in 1981, we inherited from the Carter administration a negotiating framework uh, around UN Security Council Resolution 435, which I believe you're familiar with. Um, we inherited it, but it wasn't going anywhere. So we faced a choice. Do we continue to beat our heads against the wall? Do we walk away altogether and let the Europeans handle it? Or do we maybe make some modifications to it or some additions to it? And that's what we did, the latter. We made some additions to the inherited framework by bringing into the uh, negotiating framework the issue of Angola and the Cuban presence in Angola. That Sister Kroko realized that if he didn't offer South Africa something new, uh, we would not get you into Namibia. Jack Crocker and Deputy Secretary of State Clark went to visit the South Africans, uh, in which they sat and they listened to the South Africans make all their charges about how bad the Carter administration had been and how bad McHenry had been. And and how dishonest negotiators uh, we were, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Clark and Crocker had the choice of, of, of uh, saying, we don't want to discuss what America has done. We aren't here to de denigrate what our past had been. No, they said quiet, or they even agreed. This is now public knowledge because the transcripts leaked. And Clark said to the South Africans, tell you what, you don't have to do anything on Namibia as long as the Cubans are there. And then he, says, he asked the South Africans, now what, what concession are you willing to make? And the South African says, none. He had just given away the ball game. He had just put the South Africans in the driver's seat. Because the South Africans now could determine by their own actions how long the Cubans were there. And when the demand for Cuban withdrawal came, then basically the Western Five disappeared. No one liked it because it was not something that should have come there, that it had nothing to do with Namibia. But in real, real world, without that, God knows how many years it would have taken. You know, negotiators like to have uh, tools to work with. They like to have carrots and sticks. They like to have the ability to apply and withdraw carrots and sticks. And if Namibia had been decolonized while the Cubans were still there, the Cubans could have, it would have been a cakewalk. They could have walked right down to the Western Cape. There would have been nothing to stop them if they had decided to do that. Or if the new Namibian government invited them in. And from the South African perspective of the government at that time, that was the last thing they wanted to see was Soviet supported Soviet armed Cuban troops on their border. So, so holding on to Namibia was a way of keeping that presence at 
some distance from South Africa's own borders. Um, and therefore, the idea of <coughs> linkage, which, which the uh, Reagan administration introduced into the negotiation, was that, yes, South Africans ought to leave Namibia. Yes, South Africans ought to stop coming across the border into Angola. <laughs> But in that context, which involved the implementation of Resolution 435, it would be a good idea if the Cubans also left Angola. I think was was initially a delaying tactic by the South Africans. Um, and inarguably, it bought them an amount of time. But it also established, and I wonder whether Crocker and others knew this all along, but it also established this very clear end goal. And that is that when the Cubans were removed, that was it. There was really no way to defend not only the continued occupation of Namibia, but the continued existence of forward policy for the US, I mean, for, for South Africa. So I think the linkage policy ends up being incredibly significant for the, the resolution of not just the Namibian crisis, but the entire Southern African forward policy for apartheid. But we also had to deal with the South African government of the time, which was the, uh, the government, the white minority government of the National Party, which was not about to hand over power to Swapo on a silver platter. So, in fact, they didn't want to leave Namibia at all. So our job was to persuade them that there could be a framework for leaving and decolonizing Namibia. It was Africa's last colony. <laughs> And there, there was a, a possible framework for doing that. Um, and that, yes, SWAPA would participate in the elections, and yes, they might even win. But in the right context, that could serve the interests of everybody, including the South Africans. And it was shortly after that that we began to see from our overhead, from our intelligence, that the Cuban uh, deployment uh, had changed, and we could read what they were doing from satellite pretty well, uh, from maybe 25 to 30,000 troops to very close to 50,000 troops. Um, 50,000 Cuban troops in Angola is about comparable to the U.S. force that was deployed in Vietnam at the height of the Vietnam War. It's a big, big commitment. There's no way Castro could sustain it. He could do it, but he wasn't going to do it for 10 years. He'd already been there for a long time. We now know that the reason he did it was to use it as a negotiating card, rather than you know, to say, I'm going to conquer the place and kick butt and go down into Namibia and so forth. It was a negotiating card. We now know that. At the time, it wasn't so obvious. So what you're seeing here is escalation on both sides. The South Africans had, had a good war in 1987. And then here comes Castro raising the ante in the early months of 1988. And then there was that battle you referred to, the Battle of Quito Quanaval, which was in fact a standoff. It wasn't a great um, a Cuban victory, but it was a standoff. And at the end of it, uh, South, South African artillery and Cuban tanks kind of disengaged, and the South Africans pulled back, and the Cubans took all that buildup and moved it to the so southwest from Quito Quanaval. So I, th I think that there was a sense of um, the military balance being still balanced, but at a higher level. That's the way I would summarize my answer to you. Quito Carnival ended up with the South Africans having more casualties than they had ever had, uh, with the battle taking place closer to Namibia than had ever been the case. It had always been much further north. And it occurred at the same time that the sanctions are picking up in the United States because of developments within South Africa. And the South Africans were finally forced to ask the question, 
what is more important to us? To lose lives over there in Namibia, and it looks as that's going to go at some point anyway, or give that up, concentrate on home. And that's the decision they made. If it were not the Battle of Kitakwana Valley, South Africa should not have accepted the negotiation or the resolution through resolution four, three, five. I was uh, in the office of the uh, finance minister of South Africa on the day that uh, the banks in New York pulled the rug from under them in terms of financing. Despite the fact that a lot of South Africans hated me, I had a pretty good working relationship with him. And he didn't have to tell me because I was in his office. He had information then that I would have found out about 10 minutes later, but nevertheless, he told me. That was the key of earlier pressure. And then that conflict, the turmoil that was going on within uh, the South African government as to how to handle it. Do you continue on the, along the lines of P.W. Bote, or do you look for something else? Our primary function, gentlemen, as the military component of UNTAG is the monitoring of all hostile forces in the African country of Nambabwe. In 77, I started as a commissioner for Namibia, and uh, 78, I became special representative of the Secretary General. And uh, that year, the resolution 435 was passed. So there was a framework if international community could convince South Africa uh, to move forward and allow UN to come and monitor the process leading to independence, how it would be done was clearly spelled out in Resolution 435. Resolution 435 was, uh, had lots of things that were new for the UN. And uh, some things that the South Africans had agreed upon in principle, and once they saw the plan, they didn't like. It offered the prospect of a internationally supervised transition with South African controlled police and military confined to base, with refugees returning, with the establishment of um, possibilities for refugees uh, to uh, be registered for the for the election, with election rolls prepared and election conducted and all the rest, SWAPO was confident that it would do well in the elections, if there ever were elections, under international supervision. So the, they were not opposed to 435. Included in our duties is the rapid demobilization of all civilian forces, commandos, and ethnic forces, along with the dismantling of their entire command structure. 435 called for restriction to base. 435 called for uh, a large, a very large UN force. Larger than the Reagan administration wanted. They, they opposed it on, ground, on one of the grounds they opposed it was, it was its size. But size was important in the negotiations as, in, as a means of indicating, of getting the confidence of SWAPO and others. Uh, in truth, the South African military, quite frankly, was not uh, the big bad wolf in Namibia. The big bad wolf in Namibia, the one, the thing that the Namibians were afraid of was, was uh, police. 
They were the terrible ones. It wasn't the military. It was the police. Which led to the third portion of 435. We said we were going to monitor the police. I think when we said that, when the South Africans accepted it in principle, they thought we were going to have some UN people every once in a while here, there, and so forth. They didn't realize that we were going to pull in several thousand police, trained police from around the world, who were going to be right there in the patrol car, right there on the corner with the South African police. First of all, the size of the operation, and then that we got budget approved in the fifth committee, that meant that we couldn't send anybody there. So I, I wish this process that nearly caused us a disaster. Had I had 8,000 people there on the 1st of April when the whole thing started, the situation would have been different. Uh, one of the most significant events of that era, April 1st, 1989, the day on which the whole UN Resolution 435 was to be implemented, SWAPO sent about 3,000 soldiers, guerrilla fighters, into Namibia. Now, this is one of the most sensitive political points in the whole Namibian political debate because it illustrates that you know, SWAPO wasn't exactly acting, you know, bona fide at the time. If the elections do not turn out the way that they wanted it to be, namely, a, you know, a clear victory for them, uh, they would be in a very good position militarily to then start uh, the, you know, the armed struggle anew. Fact is that Swabu didn't have any military bases inside Namibia, in spite of their many claims to the effect. If everyone hated what had happened. They were furious with Swabu, everybody. Cubans, Angolans, South Africans. So it was possible that we could find a solution. That Swapo didn't have any other choice but to say that we will withdraw. But I wish that sort of decision from their side would never have been made. But then I was also, after 12 years at the Institute, chosen to come back. Now things have moved, uh, negotiations move on, 435 had to be implemented. So I was chosen to be among the first leaders to come back. South African army was still here, war was still going on. Then we had to write a, a sign a ceasefire of South Africa through UN in a very convoluted way. And then uh, I was to come back and we took a Zambian Airways flight, DC-10, 180 people, I think. Some were soldiers, but everybody was disarmed, including the current president who was under me. I brought all of them back. And then landed here after 27 years of absence. The country has changed. We didn't know this place we do, because I was from Chumep, but it has just changed. And Let me go back. Let me go back. There is something very interesting. When we came in Namibia, everybody was just a jumping swap, 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 And all of the rallies for independence campaign were just full of swapo, swapo. People with the, the South African boss were saying swapo will never, never come here, even here after 100 years. Then people were so happy to see their sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers coming back from exile. It was a success because it was a balanced deal. It was a success because The South African authorities were themselves in transition over their own political transition at home, but also because they saw that 
there'd be something in it for them, namely the Cuban departures that I've talked about. The interesting thing is that everyone cooperated. When I look at the world today, I'm, I'm astonished at how we have lost that capacity. Uh, first of all, Cubans were prepared to leave. Angolans supported that they felt secure enough. And Russians were, were supporting that. I called this group an unholy alliance because no one in their right mind could have thought that we could actually have that sort of support. And then South Africa actually didn't have, and then Americans didn't have any other option but to support. So no one could withdraw from the process. UNTAG, the UN Transition Assistance Group, was very well prepared. It was very well staffed. It had good troops. It had outstanding political leadership in the form of former Finnish President Marty Adesari, who had been working to prepare himself for the role of transitional leader of the country, basically, for years. And I worked closely with, with Marty and have the highest respect for him. I think perhaps the long wait had also made everyone to realize that we had to get this matter solved finally and once for under paragraph 6 of the proposal for a settlement of the Namibian situation and in accordance with Security Council Resolution 435 of 1978, I hereby certified that the electoral process in Namibia has at each stage been free and fair and it has been conducted to my satisfaction. Well, the first election in the country, of course, was for the Constituent Assembly. Um, and that is the one that Swapo won with around 56 or 58 percent, I'm not quite sure anymore, um, which was for many people a great relief because um, on the one hand had the opposition parties amongst them, the DTA, won that election, uh, it might have turned violent again. And then thereafter, drafting a constitution, I was elected a chairman of the Constituent Assembly, that is to draft a constitution. I said, what I have to do is to create confidence, build confidence. Then I, and there was hatred, you know, you could see, and also the fear of the unknown, white and, white and blacks were not mixing. So I decided to see all the leaders privately before I called the formal meeting. And there was also a belief that we, as, as terrorists, uh, communists, or so on, hated the white people. They said, we don't speak Africans, we hate Africaners, we hate Africans. And there was this uprising in South Africa against that language. So there was a belief. So when I came there, I overheard them speaking Africans. He was saying something to his wife in Africans. And I just said, I also want to have where posti. where posti. Now, when I said that, that was already it, it completely, I mean, open, I mean, it, it, it just made it, you know, because here is a person that you are suspicious of, who hate Africaners, and here is this guy talking Africans, and also asking Africana tea, where posti. And I told him, Mr. David, I'm here. You know, I'm through and through Swapo. That you cannot doubt. But I'm now elected as the chairman, your chairman. And that's why I came to see you to see what, what's your bottom line? What, what, what are your fears about the black government? Why are you afraid of Swapo government? Uh, for instance, I didn't like your government because I would like my children, like your children, to have three square meals a day, at least to have lights to study during the night, go out unmolested and come back, 
Those are the things we have been fighting for. Yes, those are precisely the same principles I stand for. And Christian education. So I said, you see, Mr. David, it's a fear of the unknown. You and I have the same concerns for our children. But because we are not talking, we are not meeting, hence the fear. You see, we can finish this constitution in no time. Because we are all Namibians, we have the same concerns, peace, unity, children to play together. Why should it take that long time to draft a constitution? I talked to all others too, and then when I called a meeting formally, I knew everybody. I kind of knew how they are thinking and so on. And then drafting, I told them I'm going to give you a miracle Christmas gift. Because the belief was it will take us two years to draft the constitution. I said now. And we took three months. Why wasting time on human rights, things that we all agreed on? And we had a constitution, one of the best in Africa, if not the world. They say it, they said it that way. That we adopt this constitution by consensus and thereafter the leaders will make their statement. Any objections? If none, so Excellent constitution. And I remember still Hage Geinkop calling me and saying, can you, Marty, can you come to a reception? Because we, are, we just finished our work and I said, I'll cancel everything and come. <laughs> and then the rest is history. Na tutange sovjete na Cuba Oe tutapoto ilipo Na tutange sovjete na Cuba Oe tutapoto ilipo Uyu ni nando wa pinjala Obo manando na ditope Konja Oe tema tetu ilike Ye Tetu angulu la hobi Oh, it's too mangulula. Oh, it's too mangulula.